hello everyone. I am so running late, which makes no sense because I was ahead of schedule at one point. I don't know how this happened. So I'm probably gonna be running around trying to figure out what I'm missing as we go. Um, I'll wait and make sure we've got audio before we get started. Do I have enough water? Yeah, I've got water. Audio and video is good. Okay, tonight we are painting a Christmas ornament, a red ornament on a tree. And the cool thing about this one, I chose these specific colors because they will look so good in my own home. If this doesn't sell, you can bid on it if you want, if my website decides to work. Link is in the video description if you are within the US. This is a eight by 10. It is a Fredericks watercolor canvas board. And just for transparency, this video is sponsored by Fredericks. They provided me with the canvas I'm using here. They were already the only canvas I've used for many years. If you've been following me, you know that well before I started working with Fredericks. So um, this one, it is a watercolor canvas board, but I don't use them for watercolor. I use them for acrylic painting is my favorite, and airbrushing. I've even used them for oil paint. Wonderful canvas to paint on because they're so smooth. The techniques I'm gonna use, the blending I'm gonna be doing is really easy to do on this canvas because of how smooth it is. Fine detail and smooth blending, this is your go-to. If you want heavier brush strokes, then you're gonna wanna use like their Dixie Pro, I forget what it's called. I know I have it. I should know they recently sent me some of those on accident, but I will be doing some videos with them. But if you want that smooth, smooth blending, we want this. Oh, we are already starting the night out. Oh, wait, let's say it quietly from Sylvia. Sent a super chat. Oh, they know that word, huh? Come on. Okay. Thank you, Sylvia. You boys want, you can come over here. Wade, come here if you want your treat. We have new super chat treats. We're trying, we just, we, Chewy's sale. We tried some different treats. These ones were really limited ingredients, black wood. So they seemed pretty, it's not a very big thing, but the dogs seem to like them, huh? Okay, thank you so much, Sylvia. They're over, oh, wrong camera. Was that it? You good? Okay, go lay down, lay down, lay down. Keep going, Gibson. Go on, lay down, Gibson. Uh, at the end of tonight's stream, too, we're going to be answering art questions. So if you have any questions, leave those now. And we had a question about my, you guys know, if you've been following me, I have a lot of frogs. I've got my red-eyed tree frogs and my dart frogs. And one of my friends asked me, can you share, what? talk me out, actually, she told me to talk her out of it or talk her into getting some. So we're gonna talk about some of the pros and cons of the, the two types of frogs that I have. And I don't know, maybe you're interested in frogs and I will either talk you in or talk you out of, cause you know, it's not all good. So we'll go with that. Um, oh, also we're, we're starting the night off good. Got another, hold on, another super chat from Kirsten for happy puppers. Look at Wade's like, what, really? I just got one, I get another one. You want a super chat? Thank you, Kirsten. The boys definitely thank you. They're liking these new treats. They just came today. Good timing. Oh, those are tasty, huh? The better part, I thought the soft ones would be better, but they get stuck in their teeth when they chew and chew and chew. The, these ones seem to be a nice, like, not been a problem, huh? You like crunchy? Okay, go lay down. Thank you so much. Go lay down. Boys, lay down. Lay down. All the way. Oh, no bed switch this time. I only had, funny side story before we start, only had one bed in here. These dogs do not, Gibson is a big one. He does not share beds. But I only had one in here earlier and w Wade was already in there and Gibson knew it was super chat night. So he got in the bed with Wade, which is unheard of for a while. I actually took photos because it was so weird. Both of them were in the same bed. Wade didn't care. It was funny because Gibson didn't. Gibson's the one who doesn't like it. Anyway, let's move on. So. A little bit about this canvas board before we get started. The way that I plan to display it, assuming it doesn't sell, I'm gonna get a Christmas ribbon that goes with my decor and I'm gonna hot glue gun the back of it so it's a cute, like every Christmas, this can be hung up. So I'm not using this so much as fine art. You could also frame it and hang it that way. But for me, if I end up keeping this one, again, there's a pretty good chance because, you know, Christmas ornament. Um, yeah, this is going to be um hung with a ribbon so it's more a little bit more craft crafty in that sense but anyway let's move on so the first thing that i need to do whenever i'm painting i work with whatever is farthest back and move my way forward i've already painted a base gray you could also go with white on this would be really pretty but i went with a base just a light light gray for the background i used do i have it over here I drew out my subject. I didn't totally use it though, but I drew it out on, on tracing paper and then used transfer paper to transfer about where my branches are gonna go. You can kind of see them. 
kind of. Um, the, the cup, in order to get that completely round, I used a cup to, or the ball, I'm sorry, the ornament to get that round, I used a cup, there was a cup involved, to get that circle round. Um, because if I freehand that, it was just not going to happen. So even if I traced. So we're, with this one, we've already got that background. The next layer forward would be forward. I suddenly have an accent. I don't know what accent that is. But next we're going to be doing these kind of bluish green, like nice teal colors for the branches. Now, whenever I am doing any sort of uh, trees, grass, like anything like that, minimum three colors. And that's what I'm gonna do tonight. I'm gonna keep it simple. I'm gonna do my darkest, then a mid range, and then the lightest for the highlights on the pine, pine needles. So the darkest on here is like a dark in the very background. And this reference photo you can get over, um, the link is in the video description over on Patreon. You don't have to be a Patreon member to get it. You can just go there and download it. But I'm going to go with this dark teal color. Can you already tell I'm planning on keeping this? Like I'm gonna paint this so it looks good in my house. Because we all need more Christmas decorations. I could also just stick this, it doesn't even have to have a ribbon on it to hang if you don't want to hang it on the wall like I could set it on a shelf or something like that um, tucking in with some plans for a Christmassy look so I need to first clean up my palette I told you I was running late this is the least of things I was running late on too um, so this palette it's a new wave glass palette inside a master's uh, so it basically works it's like a Tupperware for my palette so it keeps things wet like these chunks if I stick my finger in it those are going to those would still be wet that way but these ones oh I need to ch adjust this camera a bit hold on Let's see if I can get this to where back that up a bit one second um these guys here these chunks would be wet but anything here that's dry so I'm just going to take a razor blade and this is last time I painted in acrylics was last or two weeks ago so I think that that shows you how well this keeps that paint wet now, that said, any time where I've done Liquitex Heavy Body or the Soft Body, those ones tend to dry a bit faster. So those don't stay as wet as long. Oh, that one was, and that was a Soft Body. That was definitely still wet. So I'm just gonna shove these out of the way. I don't care if they stay in the palette. I just don't want them there. Okay, so I need some teal colors. And the way that I typically mix teal is phthalo blue and phthalo green. I don't think I got phthalo green out. I grabbed hooker's green. Good enough, we're going with it. So we're just going to put some of that on, the, and I'm gonna drop it on the palette. And we need some phthalo blue. The blue on the palette I think is primary or ultramarine, so it's not ideal for creating teal. And I'll mix a little bit of black. Hopefully the black on my palette is still wet enough. I may have to grab a fresh batch of that. Um, let's go with a smaller brush. So I'm just gonna pull these two colors together so I get this nice dark, dark teal color. Tiny bit of black, I don't need much of it. But I do need this to be dark. If this isn't dark enough, my lighter colors will not stand out enough. I'm thinning that with some water. And let's come over here to the palette and I'm just going to block in a background, which actually that needs to even be darker. I'm going to pull more black because when I spread that out, it's going to get lighter. And I'm going to take a clean brush that's a little bit damp, not, not super wet, but it, it does have a little bit of water on it. And I'm just going to smudge that out. See what I mean? How it was going to get a lot lighter. So I'll do a couple of layers. First, I'm just gonna map out about where I want this branch. I don't care if the inside's perfectly smooth, but I do want the outer edges to be kind of soft. So I dabbed it with water, or I got my brush, the brush that I'm smudging with this brush. It's just an older Tack Lumber Sold Filbert, and I just got it wet. I cleaned the paint off from smudging. I got it wet, new water, and just dabbed it off on a paper towel. So we don't want it soaking wet. If it's too wet, it just works like an eraser, which is not going to work very well. A little bit up top. I don't want to pull this down too far because some of these just the needles will stick through. This is just my darker areas. So again, I'm going to definitely be going back over a bunch of this. This one's going to go behind the ornament. And I want to try not to get this all over the ornament itself because then the red is going to look weird. Same thing. I got this brush wet. And I'm going to 
smudge out these edges. It almost gives you that kind of watercolor feel, that really soft. Same thing. I'm gonna, it's starting, it's picking up too much color, so I just dab it in water again, rinse that off, dry it off, or mostly dry it off, and then smudge that out. So it's going to give you that look that the that branch especially is very out of focus, which is what I am going for here. Soft look back there. And I think I need to turn the volume on my phone in case I get a notification from one of the moms. Okay. So we've got one back here. This one's a little bit smaller. If you look at the reference photo, this one was kind of weird. So I actually, um, there was another ornament there that I did not want in the photo. The photo came from Unsplash and I cropped it down to the portion I wanted and then photoshopped this. Por there was a, a, an ornament or a light. There was something back there. I don't remember what. And then I just digitally painted, kind of half did it. It's not even a, a good job, but a background one. So that's why that leaf, if you're looking at that reference photo or that branch looks weird, it's because it's, it's fake. I photos or uh, digitally painted it and didn't try to do a good job because why bother? It was just for reference. Same thing, we're gonna smudge, but I want that nice soft edge. already excited with this. This is definitely going to be pretty. I like the soft edges we're getting in here. Oh, we have a, hold on, I'll do that in just a second. Let me get this while it's still wet. So we've got a larger one that's going to go up here and then another little one here. Okay, I'm gonna let that set, I'm gonna dry that, and I'm gonna do another layer because I need some of this to be a lot darker than what it is. But look how nice and soft, so we start getting that nice, that really out of focus look. We're gonna build on that, so let's dry that. We got another, I'm not gonna say the word out loud, and I'll read that in just a moment. I need to dry this first. So what's gonna happen with the techniques that I'm using, if this is not completely dry, when I do the next layer over it, it'll lift some of this layer. It has to be completely, completely dry. Um, and we also have a, hold on, let's make that, from Oreo Beagle gave a super chat that says, please review M Gram acrylic. So I'm not gonna promise that because one, I don't, ha I don't have the money to buy them right now, but thanks Gibson and your vet bill, but, um, Maybe the the problem for me, it's not that they that I would say I don't know much about them, but I don't think they're bad. It's that and I'd need to look into them. But my thing is when I work with acrylics, I like a more matte finish or these are satin because of the way that I layer the way that I just the top getting a good photo of the artwork alone is a huge bonus if you're using the good stuff or the more matte stuff, not the good stuff. Um, I don't like the more plasticky feel most most acrylics have while I'm working. The end result looks fine. But because of the way that I work and the way that I layer and use, use a white charcoal pencil to draw over it, it doesn't work with a lot of those other acrylics. So maybe one of these days I'll pick up a black and a white in that and just to see like what it's like. But I'm not going to make any promises because, yeah, it, most acrylics just, they have that gloss to it that I'm not looking for in while I'm painting. And with the acry Liquitex Basics, they dry slower. Although I guess it would be a good, good comparison video. Maybe I should do it. We're going to have to wait until I pay off Gibson's vet bill though because... Thanks, Gibson. So yeah, um, maybe. That was a lot of words to say, you know what, maybe. Um, but we also, you boys want a super chat? They're like, no, you're not, you're just screwing with us. You're not really gonna give another one right now. You want a super chat? Well, come on if you want one. Seriously, they don't believe me. They think I'm lying. I have the treats and everything. Do you not want a super chat? That's funny. Here they are. Um, 
Did you think I was, you were like, there's no way, it's too soon, we just had one. No way mom's given a new one this fast. Oh, thank you, that was my finger, Wade. <laughs> thank you so much for the super chat, Oreo Beagle. But yeah, well, it would make a good comparison video though, because I haven't done one of those in a really long time, so maybe that's what it needs to be. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, boys, go lay down. Go, go lay down. Boys, lay down, you got your treat, now go on. Lay down. Okay, um, Gibson, by the way, is wearing pants now too, because he had, we don't know if it's bladder infection or something, I don't know what's going on, but just in case he has a minor accident, he hasn't been, he's been fine since he's been on antibiotics or since we got back from the vet that day, so we'll see. But anyway, that's if you wonder why. He's not injured, he just, possible bladder infection, we don't know, but yeah, vet couldn't find anything actually wrong with him in the results, but she put him on antibiotics anyway, so there we go. If you were wondering, probably not. Back to the next layer. I'm gonna do the same thing I just did, but we're gonna darken some of this up because if it's not dark enough, it's really, the lights just will not show up enough. So I'm gonna go faster because we already have everything mapped out, so it's pretty easy to do now. And then same thing, we'll take that brush that's slightly damp and just smudge out those edges a bit. Notice that I'm not focusing on the intersection where it's like heavier paint, leave that alone. That is not what we're doing right now. We're just focusing on these softening your edges. If you focus on the inside, you end up pushing all the paint away from the inside and you end up with this heavy, ugly ring, which is the opposite of what we're trying to do. We're trying to get that outer edge to be nice and soft. But we want the inside darker, so that will show up. There we go. That's all we need for our base. Now we're gonna dry that and we can start putting the pine needles on. I lied, that's not done. I forgot this guy. You look weird. You need to be thickened up. You need to look like you had a bit too much pumpkin cookies too. Did I just tell on myself? That works. Okay, so I'm gonna do a couple of different ways to get the pine needles. Oh, the one is, yeah, I'm gonna save time. I'm gonna use a rake brush for the base and we'll come back on top with a round brush. But in the meantime, this brush you saw sitting over here needs to be wiped down, so I just wipe it on my paper towel and then I need to rinse that so it doesn't dry and get ruined. We're done with him for now. And the, the pine needles are gonna be a shade lighter. We need to actually add, actually, say actually again, but let's go ahead and add some white to that. We need to lighten those up. I may need to do white because that's a bit too light. Let's pull some more of the green and the blue into that. That's the wrong mouth. There we go. I'm gonna rinse that. And let's see, this might not be my best idea ever. Let's find out. I oh, know that works. So I'm just using a rake brush. And what a rake brush is, it's, this would be your normal brush. This is a rake brush. The bristles are spread out. So we are going to, oh, I see that, Rob. Thank you. Okay, hold on. Let me, let me do a few more of these and then we'll, we'll let the boys, they're going to be shocked. They're not going to believe me. They're going to think that that's too soon. Um, I can't say the word or the boys will. If you're watching the replay of this, there's a reason I sound weird. I can't say the word or the boys freak out. They are get way too excited. But anyway, so just getting the hint of some of these pine needles. I don't wanna cover up all of the dark. That's really important. 
and then I'll do the highlights with a round brush. Soften that one up a little bit. That works. And then we'll do highlights on top of that. So that gives us three tones. And while that dries, I won't need to take a hair dryer to that. We'll get from Rob. He said, because I miss you and the boys. Well, welcome back, Rob. That's a big, oh, it's a big super chat. Oh, they, they believed me this time. They didn't think I was lying. You want a super chat from Rob? I hear you're his spirit animal, Wade. Come on, bad cow. Come get your super chat. I'm really liking how quickly they can eat these ones without them getting stuck in their teeth. Yeah, that's good, huh? Okay, go lay down. Go on. Go lay down. Gibson, Wade. No, go on. Gibson. Gibson, lay down. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again. Let's throw a little bit more. I'm gonna pull this is my bright aqua green. I always call it light aqua green. And I'm gonna use that with some white just to save time so I don't have to mix as much. Actually, I'm gonna need some fresh white out. That white is really dry. probably do one shade lighter on top of this after I get some of these pine needles in. Let me find a round brush that looks like it'll work. A round, actually a small flat brush doing it sideways would also work. Either way, a liner brush I think would be a little bit too thin for what I want here. So I don't want that thin. No, this one probably will work okay. So this one's a Simply Simmons round number eight. And we're going to, so this stays blurry. We're not going to mess with that one anymore. This one doesn't have a lot. This one's fair. Ooh, that's really bright. This one's more, actually, let's wipe you off. Um, and if it's something you really hate, you can just take a brush with water. It works as an eraser as long as what's underneath is dry. And the paints that you're using are decent. If you're using like Dowler and Rowney or whatever, those may not give you, that, that may just lift everything up. But let's see, this one actually has more, dot. I could probably pull this out. Yeah, we're okay. I had to put that behind it before because the camera, when it, the canvas is so light, it flashes weird. It's very odd. So I'm going to start by getting some of the ends. And then I'm going to actually go a little bit darker for this guy, pulling some of these in. Need some more water. If you don't have enough water, if your paint is not thinned down enough, you end up, if it's like too chunky, you are not going to get nice, smooth, thin lines. And you can use a liner brush for this too, if this is too thick. And the harder you push, the thicker your line is. So if you use a real light hand, that's how you're gonna get those thinner lines, whether it be with a liner brush or with a round. Okay, I'm not making these super bold because this one is sort of in the background, a little out of focus. So I don't, the contrast isn't crazy back here. These ones are going to get, these ones especially will have the brightest. And then we've got some of these are really bright. Actually, this needs to have some pull out through the ornament. Let's get some of the dark back in there. It's just going to go in all every which direction, so we're just going to throw a few of these in there. Make sure some of that darker green shows through, and I can even come through and add more of the darker. I say green, but it's really a darker teal. So I'm mixing blue and green together to get some of those darks back in there. I'm going to pull a few of these.
Now I can always come back and add more to that one if I need to later, but I'm gonna leave that alone for now. And let's move on to these guys that are really light. They're light and it's also a bit large, like they can be, those uh, pine needles can be a bit bigger or thicker, I should say. So it's the inside, you get some kind of facing the viewer, switching directions right there. Just make random confetti everywhere. Be a, a little bit, you know, you doesn't have to be exact your reference photo, but do look at the reference photo. Need to get a lot lighter in some of this. So let's pull some more white. Um, my volume is low. Oh, I bet I know why. Hold on, I can fix that. Oops. Yep, that is why. Okay, that, ow, that should be better. I always forget to switch between computers, that setting. And then we've got this guy down here, has a lot of the light as well. And a little bit for this one here. This one's a lot closer to the viewer, so we'll get a few thicker ones. And if you were watching this live um, and you're within the U.S., if you want a original one-of-a-kind Christmas ornament, I guess, uh, painting, this is available over on my website right now if you want to bid on that. Especially helpful if you've got, or handy, if you've got a lot of teal in your decor like I do. We're going to start getting some of these little guys layering in there. I'm starting to add more white, so I've got a lighter layer. So technically, I ended up doing this with four shades. So the darkest, a mid-tone, a, a lighter one, and then a really much, much lighter on top of that. I'm just pulling the white right into the color I already had. I don't even have to mix a fresh batch. I just need to, from that corner, pull some more of the white into what's there. But having these m m colors going in here like this in layers, this is what will give you a lot more depth. If, if you just do like one, it doesn't matter how much detail you do. If there's no difference in your values in the lights and darks, it looks really flat. Get the hint of some of these back in the distance. Okay, I'm gonna leave that as it is for right now. I may, actually, I take it back. I'm gonna do a little smudging here, just so this is a little bit more out of focus. I'm gonna smudge that back. Yeah, I like that better. A little bit softer. Okay, now I need to dry this. Hold on, what is Matt texting me about? Oh, 
He was just said, well, about the boys when they were, the photo I sent him of them both laying in the same bed. See, even Matt was surprised. Okay, let's try that. Now, I don't need that to be perfectly dry because I may come back and do some more detailing. Actually, I know for sure I will. I want some, I know what I'm going to do later, but I'm going to go ahead and start layering in the red. Let's get a base red. I have a basket I just grabbed. Oops, I dropped a bunch of stuff. Um, paint I might use so I don't have to keep getting up. Let's see. What base red? I think this one looks good. Trans oh, transparent red. I don't know how transparent I really want my red to be, but the color looks good. Let's find out about using that as our base layer. I may have to do part of this on my lap just because it is really hard to get a circle quite right. Maybe that should have been a little bit more dry so I don't stick my thumb in it. I have to have a decent amount of water on this, otherwise that is not going to flow smoothly. Sorry, I know that's off camera, but it's just getting that outer edge. You're not missing anything exciting. My hand naturally only wants to move a certain way for circles. That looks not straight. It's the angle of the camera. But that is because, or that, that's normal. So just turn the canvas as you need to. Now in that case, that's a little bit out. That's okay. I will put a highlight there and cover that. You won't even know. Now I do want to smooth that out as much as I can. I don't want too heavy of brush strokes in here. Some is okay, but let's just go through that. I'm going to have to adjust the color. It looks super orange. It does not look orange at all in person. Okay. This actually works pretty good as a base here. Okay, I need to dry that, and while it cools, I can try to fix the color here. That looks really not, like it looks weirdly shaped, and it is the camera angle, because that looks way, okay, here sticks out a little too far. And it doesn't even look as, it looks worse in person there, but let's dry that. I'll show you how to fix that. changing the wrong camera. Camera two is what needs to be changed. Too much. Yeah, this is gonna make my branches in order to make the red, yeah, that is never gonna be right. Let me see if I can adjust the warmth on the light if that'll help. Sometimes it does. My branches are more teal. We're just going to deal with that. But let me see if, which camera is that? Yeah, that one. I might be able to just cool it from this. Yeah, my ornament looks more red than it really is. It is just how it's going to be, unfortunately. That's kind of, it's closer. Now my, my, here, I'll show you over here. Let's do this. Um, that's as good as that's going to get. I will show you over here because this usually has more accurate color. Those are, even there, my 
my ornament looks too orangey, but that gives you, there we go. It doesn't, yours does not have to be exact anyway, so it doesn't really matter. I just wanna show you in case somebody decides they want to bid on it. It's red, it's not orange. Okay, that was done with transparent red. Now, if I had green, like you can kind of see here where the green was behind, see how it's a little darker? It is transparent, but because it's over that light gray, it, it's solid colored enough. So whenever your colors are too translucent, if they're up, like paint that area white first. So reds, oranges, yellows, I don't, it's funny that that's listed as translucent red. They're all translucent, like red is tra going to be translucent, at least with the Liquitex Basics. So you just put a layer of white underneath, or in this case, light gray, and the color comes out really pure on top. Okay, now I need to start putting in these darker values onto the ornament. So this is a deep dark plum for the shadow. So I've got some purples and magentas. We'll throw a little bit of black in there. Because of the glare, I can't even see what color I have. That's super helpful. I think I need some more black. Let's actually, I'm gonna mix it over here so I can see that light is horribly glary. I'm gonna throw a little bit of red in there. So I've got some plum, some dioxazine purple, some black, some red. We're just gonna throw a little bit of everything in there. And there we go. Now I've got to do the same thing first, get that outer edge smooth. Uh, let's see what coat, which brush, I need to have one ready to smudge. There we go, you will work. This is most of that. There will be a highlight. We'll come back over that later. So I don't have to go all the way to the edge. Now I'm not copying the reference photo exactly. I don't like how you can see the room and the windows and the like vents or something. So mine will be a bit different. But you get the hint of the tree there, the dark. And then I'm gonna take this brush just a clean brush, same thing we did with the trees or the branches, whoops, that's got too much water, it's working too much like an eraser. I'm gonna come around the edges and just smudge those up a bit. Now, depending on how shiny and reflective your ornament is, it can have a ton of detail, that is up to you. I don't want that much detail, I want it to be a bit softer. darker shadows in here. Now part of what will make this look so shiny is this really high contrast with the lights and the darks. It feels very scary to go that dark on top of that bright of red, but that's what's going to make it look really shiny. That looks black, it's not. It's dark purple, plum colored. Yay for light, for webcams not being accurate in color. I just want to get a few different shapes in there, but I want it way softer, so I've got a lot more water on that brush. Whoops. Let's do that. Yes, I just licked my finger out of habit because I do that all the time. You have a painting for me, you have my DNA. Don't frame me for anything. There we go, we'll just wipe that off. Got a little bit of a shadow here. And I'm just gonna push that to that outer edge. Now, if your ornament is not perfectly shaped, don't worry when you go through and you do the shading because like we're not putting a dark ring all the way around it. It's only on part of it. That helps break up the fact that your circle is, I mean, it's probably never gonna be perfect. That'll break a lot of that up. Just pulling a few areas. Where it's got a little bit darker. Okay, we're gonna dry that and start putting in some highlights. If you have not already, if you could hit that like button, I will love you forever, or at least until the next live stream. It makes me feel special. Okay, so now we've got the darks in, we need to start getting some of these lighter values in.
Okay, we need a coral color. And I actually have, this will probably work. This one is rose pink, but that mixed with a little bit of the reds and yellows should give me a pretty good, or even just that with the translucent red might work. I don't know, I'm gonna add a little bit of orange just in case. That is not coming out. This light is not angled. Oh, there we go. That is why I can't see. Oh my gosh, so much better. So we've got, although I'm a little bit blind from it having been in the wrong spot for too long. I'm mixing some of my red, a little bit of that rose pink, which the rose pink is a very opaque. It's got, well, it's white is mixed in with it. So your red and white would get you that color. And then a little bit of orange so that it's not so um, rose pink. Now that feels scary when you first do it because it's super bright, but it needs to be. That high contrast is what makes it look shiny. And I'm gonna soften the edge a little bit, but not a lot here. I don't want it super fuzzy. Some of this I'm not even going to blend at all. I'm just going to leave it a harsher shape. But already now, I mean that little thing, now we've got some shine. And we'll definitely be putting more with the white on top of that. So this is actually the windows that the shine is. I'm not gonna try to make mine look like windows. I just want those highlights. If you are playing it safe and keeping it all mid-range, yours is not going to look very shiny. So some of the reference photos I found with the ornaments was, were really cool, um, but it was that frosted glass. That, so that can look cool, but it's not that, you know, if you're going for shine, actually for the shine on that edge, I need it to be that coral color again, not white. Oops, there's white mixed in with that. We've got some little shine marks. Actually, I'm going to switch to a smaller brush for some of these little ones. Oh my gosh. Hold on one second. It works out well because we can let that dry. We've got from Hitomi, I'm sorry, I just butchered your name. Um, Hitomi said, I look forward to Wednesday evenings for the M Graham paint comparison. Oh, she just funded it. Hold on. I'm writing this down. I'm going shopping. She is funding that. Um, that review for sure. Let's see, we, I'm writing your name down though because I want to make sure you get credit when I do that review. Tell me. My paper is wet, that's not working. I'm screenshotting it. Let's, let's make my life easier and just do a screenshot. If I can find where my screenshot is. Um, I hear Gibson huffing. I think he knows what's about. Yeah, his head's up. Gibson knows. He's like, um, excuse me. Okay, why didn't that save? Oh, it did save. How do I save this? This is not 
like Windows. Can someone write that down that or screenshot it for me in case mine doesn't save like I want it to? Um, but she had said, I look forward to, or actually I'm, a, it's pink, so I said she, I don't know. I look forward to Wednesday evenings for the M. Graham paint comparison and the dog's treat. I always wanted greyhounds. They are such good dogs. Um, but let's go ahead, Gibson knows. He is, he, I hear him huffing. Oh, he put his head down. Do you boys want a super chat? You got a big one. I'm excited. I'm putting that towards. We are ordering those paints. So everyone think Hitomi. But I hope I'm not butchering the name up. Oh, we're going to try different paint. We're going to do a comparison video. Yes, we are. That's very good. You're drooling in the paint. Oh my gosh, Wade. Not the paint I'm using, it's the closed containers, but they're on the floor and his drool is just. <sighs> okay, go lay down, lay down, good boy. You got it all. Wait, here, Gibson, those are dog treats. Go, or no, they're not dog treats, they're paints. Go lay down, Gibson, lay down. Gibson, lay down. He's like, nah, I can do what I want. I was sick on Saturday, so I know everyone will be extra nice to me and I'll, I'll just do whatever I want. Gibson, he's like, don't have to listen to you. Okay. Oh, thank you, Rob. Okay. Okay, I'm excited to try those now. Um, I'm pretty happy with this ornament. That looks nice and shiny. We need a few more spots. So I was gonna switch over to, whoops. Okay, let's switch to the coral color. We've got a few little dots, so it'll look, give it a shiny look. And I'm going pretty close to the reference photo, just doesn't need to be exact. We have, let me get a couple more dots. We got another one. The boys are so getting spoiled tonight. You guys are awesome. Okay, just gives it a little bit more shine. This is the most, like it so looks, I wanna show you in this camera, it looks so lopsided, it, it really isn't. Like it's not, it's the, depending on the angle, it looks more and more lopsided than what it really is. Um, okay, and we have from Oreo Beagle sent another super chat for, let's see. They don't believe me, look at, they're not even listening. They're like, nah, we just had one. You guys want another super chat? Come on, you can come get a super chat. I'm not messing with you. I actually don't even know why they think we're messing with them. Like if, if one of us during the day, Matt will say something about super chats or that word comes up and Gibson's head perks up, it's like kind of like the Amazon device, always listening for her name. There you go. Thank you for the slobber. Um, Gibson is always, and whenever we make a mistake and say that word in front of them, they always get a treat like during the week too. So I don't know why they're acting like I'm lying about it. Okay, go lay down. Lay down, lay down. Why do you want to get into my paint? Leave the paint alone. Go lay down, lay down. I'm not doing much in the way of bed swaps tonight, which is odd. Okay, now we need to make this look shiny and metallic. No, they're definitely not full, Joe. So, or who said that? Uh, was it, somebody just did it and I scrolled too fast. Yeah, Nick said, they're like, I'm full. I, no, they are a bottomless pit. They ne I have never seen a point where they did not want more. Okay, now we've got to do this gold metallic look. So it's really just kind of a peachy color. We're gonna use some, I've got red oxide. I can pull some of that rose pink in there. A little bit of, well, we grab that blackish plum that I used earlier. What, really what I'm doing is just getting a sort of tan color. That's what I'm trying to mix without actually getting more paint out because I'm lazy. What I need to do is start with black and white and then mix my color into that. So there's my black and white. Now I can start pulling this color that I mixed into it. 
There we go. That's a nice kind of tan. Now the way that it'll look metallic is simply from high contrast. Same as this looking shiny, just high contrast. So let's get a base layer. And then I can use that same tan color for the little hoop guy. Now, if you are resting your hand like I am on your canvas, make sure that's dry. I can't tell you how many times I've accidentally had a little area be wet and then made handprints all over. So annoying when that happens. Okay, now I need a color that is far darker for the darkest portion. So basically the same thing, I'm just gonna add some black and plum into that. I don't know if this will be dark enough, let's find out. Maybe. We just have some lines coming down. Let me get some. It's got a little bit darker here. I saw that dolphin soul. Got the boys' names wrong. Too crazy. And now we need to just take white. <laughs> Joseph said, that's how you know it wasn't made by AI. <laughs> okay, let's get some bright. It was made by AI it would have like two random or three hands for some reason even if it doesn't require hands that's like AI's thing let's get some highlights little shine here little shine back here these are way too bright back there I need to tone those back down Let's go back to our tan color and cover some of these up. These were more in shadow and I made them not in shadow. That's much better. Okay, and there was a little metal guy, super thin. I'm gonna to switch to a liner brush for that one. And he's just hooked into the tree. Little ornament, okay couple of final touch-ups and then this guy will be done. So one of the things that I wanted to do was add some brighter highlights with more white on the tips of some of these branches or the pine needles. It gives it a more sparkly feel. Plus the reference photo does have that anyway. So we'll do what we've got some time. I actually did pretty good time-wise. I can spend a couple minutes here and just make a few of these stand out more. Now, one of the things I will do off camera, well, it is way more, like it's, the circle is really actually pretty good, but there's a few areas I wanna clean up just a bit. I'm gonna do that off camera so I can turn it and like have my face an inch from it while I do that. Um, so that'll get perfected a bit more. This one has a lot more of the ends. And 
this one down here, I need more darks. Let's say I need a, just variation a bit more in some of these. So same thing, my phthalo blue and my green, a little bit of black. Well, really that's more of the plum, but whatever, it's dark, I'll take it. It's kind of perfect. And so I'm, I, with the darks that are already there, I'm, I'm basically just working with those, I'm not really co creating a bunch of new ones, I'm just darkening up a few patches. These little extra guys in there. I think that's pretty good. I like it. Oh, I want to darken this area. And so what I'm going to do, so I don't have to redo the detail. I'm just going to dry this first. I want this bottom branch just to be a little bit darker and also this will soften the whole look so or for that branch so I'm going to take some of the green and blue just the green and blue though I don't want any white mixed in with that because that will make it opaque and that is the exit like it'll make it fuzzy and that is not the look I'm going for right now so I thin that with a bunch of water and I'm just going to glaze over that let's just push those back much better oh I like that Okay, and then to sign it, yeah, I'm just gonna sign it in this bottom corner here, I think. I think. I always hold it, brush to the side where I want that signature. How does that affect the balance? Yeah, I feel like it's too heavy with the, the signature there. I want my signature over here. I'll go with just a pale green. Um, where did my liner brush go? I just had it. Nope, that is definitely not a liner brush. I just got red all over my hand. Um, I want to keep this fairly light. I'm not trying to draw that much attention towards the bottom. Maybe not that light. That blends in way too much with the, um, the gray. There we go. Okay, and that one is finished. This definitely looks a little bit more black. I, the, it has a more plum, like there's more richness to it in person. Let's see if it looks very good on this, because it sometimes does. Yeah, that color is pretty accurate. Oh, I like how this came out. I am super happy with that. I love that accent of red with teal so much. Oh my gosh, so pretty, yay! Okay, so we've got questions. And after we go through a bunch of the art questions, we'll be talking about the pros and cons of, do you, you guys know I have dart frogs and red-eyed tree frogs. Let's talk about why you do and possibly, probably don't want them yourself. Um, so we'll, we'll go through that. But let's go ahead and go through questions. Questions. 
Okay, so the first one um, over on our Patreon Discord, Rhea had asked in the critique last week, uh, which I really enjoyed. Yay, thank you for doing these. You are very welcome. Thank you for submitting. An issue came up that I'm struggling with at the moment. If a 3D object looks rather flat in the reference photo and I copy it in my artwork, it won't always look good because it's too flat. How do I handle these situations? I think it came, uh, I think this came up in a piece with a frog where the frog was full on in the light without any darker values in the reference photo, which caused it to look flat. In my case, I want to paint a rabbit sitting in the sunlight after copying my reference photo. The rabbit looks way too boring and flat. So I wanted to add some darker values, but that means I'm inventing shadows where there are no shadows in reality. How much fake shadow can we add before it breaks the logic of realism where, w that we are trying to achieve? Are there any tricks for these situations? Okay, so I know exactly what you're talking about and you need to, you, you have to learn by, by using better reference photos first. So once you, let's, let's use a rabbit for example. Let's say you're an artist and you love painting rabbits. Right now, no, don't use a photo. If it is in dead flat sunlight, like midday, and it's just all washed out so you don't have the definite lights and darks, that's not the right photo for you. Find a different reference photo. When you are learning, when you're at that stage where you're like, well, I don't know where to put the shadows, that is the stage where you should only be using reference photos where you can see the lights and the darks clearly, where it looks three-dimensional. You want your really high quality reference photos at that stage because you will eventually get to the point where you've painted, I don't know if that number is gonna be 50 for you, I don't know if it's gonna be 100 for you, but when you've painted enough from a good, good, high quality reference photo where you've got the definite lights, definite dark, so usually not taking midday because midday is not your best time. Like as an artist, midday, it can work, there are way better options. Early morning, late afternoon, that lighting is way more appealing. Like from the artistic standpoint, way more appealing. But because you can see the shadows and the highlights and you get more depth in the piece. But you will hit a point where you've done so many rabbits with, from good photos that you can take a crap photo and make it look good. Uh, but not yet. You're not there yet. If you're asking that question, and this isn't to bash you, it's just you're not at that stage yet. No problem. That lets you know you need to look for different different lighting situations in your reference photo. You want a reference photo where you where it looks three-dimensional because you can't learn the dimension if you're starting from flat photos. You're never going to learn the dimension if you keep going with the flat photos. It does, a, I always tell clients this too when they hire me for, or when I used to do pet portraits, what makes for a cute photo does not always make for a good painting. So you want that really high contrast, the lights and the darks as you're learning because that's how you learn. You're not gonna learn by trying to invent the shadows, what you're talking about, do, where do I invent, you know, I feel like I'm inventing them, where would I put them then? Exactly, you would be inventing them and they're not gonna look good because you've not yet learned where they go. You've gotta go from that good, high quality photo in the first place and every time. like at least the first 10 rabbits you paint should be from high contrast, good photos where you can really see where those shadows go. And it will hit a point, save this photo. This photo may work for you in the future once you've learned where the lights and darks would go because you understand the anatomy of that rabbit so well, you know where the shadows would be if it was taken under different lighting. So that is my suggestion for you there is, and, and it gets so much easier the more you paint but it only gets easier the more you paint if you're working from good reference photos, whether it be reference photos you got on like Unsplash or Pixabay or reference photos you bought that you need, or, uh, or you bought, or that you took yourself. It need, you wanna look for the ones that have more interesting lighting that you can see all of that. That's how you learn, not from, if you keep picking easy photos that it's just flat looking, your artwork will, you're not going to improve because you're never learning because you're not working from those good photos, but do a bunch with the good, good lighting before you start jumping into the kind of crappy photos but making them look good. You'll hit that point. You're not always gonna have to have this perfect reference photo. I can take a reference photo now on many, many subjects. Orcas and dolphins are great for me because I've done it so many times. I can take the most basic, I can take an outline and make it look realistic because I've done it a million times but not in the beginning. In the beginning, if I started inventing it, I would have made them look so deformed because I wouldn't have known where the lighting went because I hadn't done it yet. So that is, that is how you do that is just really going with a lot of good photos in the beginning. Not, don't, do not choose the flat photos right now. Okay. Um, let's see, Dolphin Soul said, this technique of branches, can it be done with ink tents? Mm, no. 
With ink tents, it would be different because I would want to keep the entire background wet while I got those branches to blend smooth. That starts to dry, it doesn't really work the same. You can get kind of, but not really. Like I, it, it would be a different, it would be closer to how, to how I would want to do it with watercolor where I keep that entire background wet. So I would like uh, mask out the ornament and then just keep the whole background stays wet while I blend that soft look. So it would be very different. Elise said, have you tried Golden's flat acrylics? They are like Holbein acrylic. Well, I don't use Holbein, so, cause don't trust that company. There are reasons, um, but I say I don't trust, not telling you not to trust. You trust who you want. Um, Golden's flat, I have not, I'm curious though. I've wanted to, that is one I saw the ad for it. I definitely want to try them because I love their airbrush paint. So I'm a huge Golden's fan. So I definitely want to, and I talked to, it was like the grandson of the guy who, who made the company. I don't know, I talked to him at, a, at an event and so nice. Like I really liked, like you just got that good vibe from them. So I, I yes, I would like to try those. Um, but first I'm doing, what was it? I have to look, whatever you guys wanted, the other one. Uh, Brittany said, I was taught by a university instructor. Already I have questions. <laughs> I already am like, hmm, suspect. I haven't even finished this yet. Might be good, might be trash. Uh, to cut up a Mr. Magic eraser into smaller squares and use that to erase mistakes done in watercolor paints. I don't know on that because I don't watercolor often enough. Like I'm not a good watercolor artist. I can make a watercolor look good, but that does not make me a good watercolor artist, if that makes sense. So yeah, I don't know on that. Anytime I hear like an, an instructor in a college or anything like that, um, especially university instructor, I'm always like, mm, already I don't trust it. Already you get the, um, yes, pessimistic Lisa of, mm, I don't know. That might be a, a valid way to go. I, I genuinely don't know. Uh, Puff Stitch said, I noticed that you didn't paint the background first on this one. I did paint the background. Uh, what do you have planned for the background? That was it. I did paint it. I painted it soft gray. That was the plan on that one. Python said, how do you decide what to paint? I toned a canvas a week ago and I still don't know. I've been waiting to try out my Golden's heavy body acrylics, but I don't know what to paint. Arg. I will look through, I ha so I keep a folder on my, my computer for inspirational things, whether it be somebody else's art that I just like the color palette or I like the style or, you know, I'm obviously not gonna copy it, just to inspire me to like, get my ideas going. Um, and in just reference photos that are royalty free, I save those to a folder for inspiration, for ideas. Uh, so that helps. A sketchbook is always helpful to just drop jot down, jot, I can't talk down ideas, loose stick figures if you need to, it doesn't matter. But that way when you're sitting there ready to paint, you've got some ideas ready to go, like ready, you've already saved. So in those down moments where you're like, I can't think of anything, make a folder on your computer or your phone or whatever and start saving those. Like you can make it on Pinterest. Start saving things that inspire you that you can then take like, okay, I like this style, I want this type of bird, I want this type of style, I want these colors and I'm gonna figure out how to combine those three elements together, those colors that subject, that style. That is how I decide typically what to paint. Now it's a little different for me because I do rotate to make sure that I try to keep everyone on Patreon happy because I know not everyone likes colored pencil, not everyone likes acrylic or oils or whatever. So I rotate mediums regularly there. But which by the way is a good time to bring up. If you are not already a member for as little as $6 a month, you get access to over 400 videos in multiple mediums, 400 now. I've been making videos there since 2015, 14 the end of 2014, holy crap. That is a lot of, yeah, 400 videos. So you, $6 a month, you get access to all of them. And then we've got different rewards depending on the tier that you choose. Like we've got the coloring pages just went up. If you are, I think aqua tier or higher, and you can use those to like ink tents over or watercolor, or if you wanted to print them on wa uh, a watercolor paper. So that's fun, or you could color. Um, We've got reference photos. We've got group challenges that just went up. We have a new one of those that I also want to, I think I may join in on this group challenge because I really want to paint that one myself. Um, it's cardinal, spoiler alert. So yeah, we've got some different rewards, but for $6 a month gets you all the videos. So that is really cool. Um, anyway. Oh, I don't get to keep this painting. Somebody bid. Um, congratulations to whoever bids or whoever wins. Um, let's see. I may have to paint one for myself now. Let's, where was I? Um, Aurora said, hey, I have a question. I was following a tutorial of yours on Pam Pastel and I'm having a hard time getting the colored pencil to show up without burnishing, especially the white. Any tips for me? 
No, I need more information. The type of paper you're using will make a huge difference. So if the paper is a little bit too smooth, then your colored pencil is just not going to stick on top of that. Um, if you put an insane amount of, pa I've never hit enough pan pastels where the colored pencil wouldn't stick, so that's not a problem. You can burnish, that's fine. You just need to know that's like your top layer. You're not going to get a whole lot more on top of an area you burnish. So there's nothing wrong with burnishing over it. If you know that's your final, like, I don't need more details on top of that. Um, but yeah, I think I need a little bit more information there. I would guess it's the paper, but I don't know for sure without, well, knowing. Um, Python said, how do you pick good reference photos? I always use reference photos with a lot of value contrast, chroma and hue contrast and high quality resolution, but what else do I look for? I would say composition too, but composition you can adjust yourself. So even if the photo's not great, you can change the composition and still get that. So that, I mean, I look for that, but um, no, it sounds like you're looking for what I look for. I want that moody, high contrast, like that is what I want. Now, obviously not on the live stream stuff because I need to get this done in an hour. But if it was like something that I want to do for myself, for example, I'm working on one. I don't know if you can see it. Let me see if I can grab it. I'm working on an oil painting. Oh, I'm not used to those paints being there. I almost killed myself. Um, I'm working on a little owl. That's actually the type of owl. I didn't even know they were called that. Learned something new the last couple of weeks. But this reference photo comes from wildlifereferencephotos.com. Now, it is a good photo. It's a clear photo. It is very, um, like I can see the detail. I like the composition. Like the way it's cropped, it follows rule of thirds. Loved that. I, lo I have the perfect square canvas to go with that composition. I was super excited. Why are you moaning, Gibson? I heard that. Um, I think I'm keeping him awake. But I liked all of that. But the color was in the background was super bright green. It was like too green. I love green. It was too green. So I went with a moodier look. I wanted something more moody. I love the, the dark, dark, dark there. The darks, the light, like these colors. I adjusted that in Photoshop so I could get that moody look that I wanted. The reference photo had high, kind, mostly high contrast. This is way more contrast than that reference photo had. Um, but that's what I'm looking for. I want that. I like that kind of moody feel when it's something for myself. Now it's, again, it's different with a live stream because these are quicker projects, but when I'm choosing something like this will probably end up hung on my wall. I like that more dramatic look. And so that's what I'm looking for in a good photo. But the, the most important thing is I want the angle of the animal to look good. Every once in a while, you'll get an angle where it's just, whether it's front on or whatever, the, it just looks a little bit weird. So I try to avoid that. But um, yeah, high contrast, interesting lighting. That is like, I would say is the biggest thing. If I can find something with interesting lighting that like just gets you excited to paint that because of the high contrast, not just a high contrast, but that the lighting is interesting. That is probably the biggest thing I look for. I mean, some of the reference photos that just went up over on Patreon were the flamingos and both of them, one of them, the one that was a single one, People might look at that and go, oh, the, and it, there was a there was a time, if I went back 20 years ago, I would have seen that photo. I mean, like the weird lighting from the leaves, the shadows of the leaves hitting the bird and the light coming through that, like so parts are really light up against the dark shadows. I would have seen that when I was younger and went, I can't paint from that. Like, I, I can't see everything. No, that's what you want. I'm looking for clarity, which you've got, high contrast, but interesting lighting. And again, if we go back and look at, if you're on Patreon, you can see that. The one, I think it was on the $6 tier. I could have that wrong. But it was the, the way that the light is coming through and you can see the shadows of the leaves on the bird, that is what I'm looking for. That is gonna make for much, much more interesting art than simply high contrast. And high contrast is important, we all know that. Dark darks, light lights, that moody, you know, really just dra drastic look. But interesting lighting, the light coming through the trees, light coming through mini blinds, or I don't think they're called mini blinds anymore, they're just blinds because they're thicker. They're not mini. Um, full-size blinds, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that sort of thing is what I'm gonna look for. Okay. And is this not refreshing? I think it's not. Okay, here we go. No, I got that one. So while I wait, we've got more questions that are coming in, but I'm going to go really quick um, actually, we'll come back to that. We'll do that. Uh, thank you, Fly Me to the Moon. She said, wow, beautiful. Python said, can you demonstrate the rough look dry brushing gives with acrylics? I did that kind of last week, so I don't, I'm, or not last week, the week before. Um, 
so I kind of don't want to do it again and I don't have something up here to do that with. Actually, you know, it would work really well. Maybe. Let me think on that one. Um, if I do it, I may just make a full complete video about why I don't like that and, and what happens because, yeah, I'm not sure on that. Um, keep those art questions coming in while we wait for more art questions. Let's come through. I want to talk a little bit about because I do, I, I feel like this, like I have a duty to talk about the pros and the cons with all the animals I have. I don't go anywhere. I don't travel. My life is just, I take care of animals. I paint. I work on Patreon videos so and YouTube videos. So that is my life. But, and Saturdays I go get a cupcake. Like seriously, unrefined bakery has gluten-free stuff and it's amazing. But anyway, moving on or pumpkin cookies. So they call them cookies, but really it's like a scone. It's a lump. It's a pumpkin lump. Um, and I'm not scone is what I call them. But moving on, no one cares. So the frog thing, uh, which camera? I'm going to pull this camera up. Um, let's see. The frogs. So I want to first talk about how often you actually see them. I have two different types, well, technically three different types of frogs, two uh, different types of dart frogs, and then my red-eye tree frogs. So red-eye tree frogs are, well, arboreal. They, they, they're up in the, they're all high humidity, but red-eye tree frogs, I usually keep around 60% humidity. So the dart frogs are going to be much higher. I don't know if they're like 80%. I don't even know what theirs are. The humid humidity readers never really work very well, so there's that. We go by, does it have a lot of like dew all over in the mornings? It's humid enough. But um, let's talk about some of the pros and cons and the actual care involved because it's easy to look at what the photos I post and think, oh, that's super easy. That's so cute. I want some. So we have, let's see, let's pull this out. So red-eye tree frogs, let's start with them. This is what, you know, the photos I post all the time of Glitch. I've got Captain Cookie, the the one in the middle there, the albino. I mean, just so, these guys are so cute. I post those photos. But you know what I actually see all day? It is not that. I see that. They're nocturnal. So until lights get, like I put them to bed at about midnight, one in the morning, and they are going to be awake. It's 12 hours on, 12 hours off. They are, you don't really see them. They're not super active. Now, the vivarium is gorgeous. I, it's actually a terrible photo, but I love the vivarium. So the plants are as important to me, well, not as important, but I love having that look in, like, it's just gorgeous. And I have two of those. I've got uh, my two special needs frogs, Glitch and the Baby Derp. And I, I, he has a name. I just don't remember because I just call him. He's just this cute, he's so cute. His two front legs are too, are not long enough. They didn't grow right. So he's kind of lopsided. Anyway, he's adorable. But those two are in one that is, I think that tank is 24 by 24 by 18. Um, this one here is about 67 gallons, I think is what that one works out to be. So this tank, a lot of people will tell you in that size, I could fit seven frogs in there. No. So they're what we call bioactive. So the dirt has isopods, roly polies is what a lot of people used to call them. Um, I've got cool orange ones, powder oranges in there. I've got springtails in there. I've got, you know, you've got good bacteria growing in there to keep like break down the waste. I, because we call that the bio load, how much waste versus, you know, how much it's getting cleaned up by your, your, um, your critters, your, your cleanup crew. I only keep three in this tank because even though it's 67, it's huge. Those frogs are not that big. Well, my female's bigger, but the murky's big, um, Glitch's sister, but then the two, the two boys are little. So I've got a lot of empty space with no frog because I don't want the bio load to get too heavy. This is one of the reasons a lot of people end up with bacterial infections because there's too much poop not in a cleanup crew and this isn't the sort of thing that you keep sterile. I don't like sterile setups because that alone can lead to bacterial issues because the frog has no natural immunity because it's not being exposed to good bacteria. You know, it. I'm not going to go into a whole science lesson. But anyway, um, so yeah, you've got all the cute photos I post all of the time. Cute frogs, but re the reality is this, whoops, um, that, wrong one. That is what you're going to see all day. So in that, again, three frogs in that one. I have two in a slightly smaller tank, the one for my special needs uh, the pair. So something to keep in mind there. The next thing, they all either come with or get parasites every time. Of 10 frogs I've had, of red-eye tree frogs, I've lost one to a bacterial infection, three to parasites. Because a lot of companies like Josh's Frogs is where I got them initially, and they all came loaded with parasites. 
But when you contacted Josh's Frogs, because, and this isn't a, a bash on Josh's Frog, sort of it is, because they really should know better. But people have this attitude of a, um, if they're captive bred, they won't have parasites. And that's not true. They get parasites from the crickets that they eat. They have to eat them. They will not eat something that's not live or not moving. And crickets are really your main staple for these guys. They won't eat most anything else. I wish they would eat dubia roaches like my dragon because those are so much easier and aren't as prone to parasites as the crickets. So these guys have to be dewormed on a fairly regular basis. Are you willing? Do you want to deal with a vet? Or, and, and most vets don't really, they're not great with that. Can't, in my case, I do uh, fecal tests myself. I have a microscope and I can do a test once a year or so to check to see if they've got a over the top, you know, if they've got parasites, then I'm going to have to deworm them. And I just dust the crickets with the, the panicure, which isn't uh, dosage, questionable, whatever. It's worked for me. But um, you will inevitably, eventually end up with parasites. They need to be dewormed. A lot of people say these guys only live five years. That's because people don't deworm them. Their parasite load gets so high and that's what ends up killing them so soon. They should live closer to 20, 15, 20 years. They are not, you know, if everything is right. Now, bacterial infections and parasites, those are your two things that are most often going to kill them and people don't realize. I hear people go, oh, they had failure to thrive. Failure to thrive is not a thing. All failure to thrive means sorry, side rant here, is I didn't figure out what was wrong with my animal. And it happens. That's not necessarily, but it's not failure to thrive. There was a condition, like one girl kept posting about that. She tried everything to save it, except doing a fecal exam. You tried everything except the one thing I told you would fix it, but you didn't want to listen because, oh no, mine's captive bred. It can't have parasites. They all have parasites. It comes from the crickets. Okay, moving on. So these are things, you know, there's drama involved with these. When I got started, when I had to learn about parasites, because very few people, there was a guy um, in Holland who actually walked me through the whole parasite thing because no one knew, like even the good breeder that I went through who I love, and now she tests because she didn't even know it was an issue at the time. Um she tests regularly and treats her frogs, but she didn't, she didn't know, nobody knew because everybody insists, oh no, they don't get parasites. I don't know what the thing is about denying they get parasites. They've all got it. So that's just something you need, be, need to be aware of. And it's not just these guys. These guys are more sensitive to parasites than other tree frogs, like White's tree frogs. If you look them up, big dumpy frogs, they're awesome. They're so much hardier. So they still get parasites. They just handle it a bit better. They're not as sensitive. These guys, extremely sensitive. So they are, a, this is a much harder species to be successful with. Um, it took me, it took me some, some work to get good with these guys, to really get the setup just right to, well, really it wasn't even just the setup. It was mainly the parasites. So they have to go through quarantine. You need to do a fecal exam, make sure that if they're negative, you're fine. You can go ahead and put them in your main vivarium. But yeah, it, it's just, you need to know about that. So the, that is them. And again, this is what I see all day. I don't see the frogs all day. I mean, sometimes you'll see them stuck on the glass in like a little bean and their little toe beans because um, they fold up, adorable. So I love them, worth it to me, but not everyone necessarily wants that. The other thing is that you're gonna feed them crickets. I keep a 10 gallon tank with a screen lid over it and egg crate and I put uh, carrot shavings, which get the cheap stuff from like Target. Carrot shavings in there is what I feed my crickets. I have to get a new batch of those every single month. And I get, I get them in either a one to 2,000 quantity. Now that the dragon is mainly, he eats, um, he doesn't eat money bugs now, but he gets roach, uh, he'll get the dubia roaches. So I don't go through the crickets as often, but let's say one to 2,000, they're about $16 for a box of 1,000. So however many you go with. And those only live about a month. Within a month, I've either used them all or what I had has pretty much died off. So every month I've got to get a new bat box, but the the shipping is about twenty dollars so twenty dollars plus the 16 so just to keep in mind like how much i go through and that's just for two for five frogs uh so glitch and uh her boyfriend and then uh the three that are in the big one there so that's kind of crickets are annoying uh they smell bad I keep them in my laundry room and it just, it doesn't like permeate, but it's, you walk, you can smell them and I'm weird about smells. So I'm not loving that. They escape all the freaking time. So I'm constantly finding crickets and, and disposing of them. Um, that, those are definitely things to keep, you know, to be aware of. So the next set of frogs that I have, I think that goes over the, the pros and cons. The big thing is just, you're going to, they're going to have parasites. You're going to have to deal with parasites. Now, the dart frogs, less likely to have parasites because these guys eat fruit flies. Fruit flies, not as likely, at least in my experience. I've never had an issue with them. So this one, let's see. I don't like missing one of them. These are, 
So there is my Santa Isabel, one of them. I have three. Well, I have a whole bunch because they had tadpoles. Um, I'm currently trying to freeze the tadpoles. But anyway, um, that is Santa, my Santa Isabel. But what I, I, those are the ones you hear in my background all the time. And they're about the size of my pinky nail, like tiny, tiny little guy. Or maybe my thumbnail. No, closer to my, th less than my thumbnail. Um, they're little, little guys. But they're loud, which is awesome. I love them. But um, that's what I actually see all day. I see them occasionally. They're a little bit more, like, they're not out all the time. They're just loud all the time, which, again, I personally love. I also have, which I apparently didn't put in here. Let me grab them. Um, these, I would say that the dart frogs are easier. Um, and I'll show you in a minute here. I've got some Lucamellas. I don't know how I didn't end up with their photos. Lukes, here they are. This isn't gonna go in the right location, but whatever, we're just sticking it there. There's my Lucamellas, my bumblebee dart frogs. Fat girls, they are chunks, but they're a little bit bigger. They're more like me, about this size. There, there are some of the bigger ones, and those girls, um, are in another, they're out a lot. Like you really do see them, but they're all females so they don't chirp, they're a barker. The males have an awesome call. I was hoping for males. I got all three females. But anyway, so that is those guys. But again, going back to, so them I do see, they're in a very similar vivarium to this one. Um, these guys eat fruit flies. So fruit flies, you can breed your own. They, you basically have to make a new batch every single week and you rotate them because once this container is a month old, it needs to be tossed because it starts getting infested with mites, which kill the fruit flies. So you have to rotate it so you never get an overwhelmed with mites, which is, it's a whole thing. I keep them on um, diet to whatever earth, DE. Um, it, they, the container sits in that so that the mites can't spread to other containers. It's a whole thing. But the, to make this, you get this little Celsius or whatever, there's like little shaving things in there, um, or that's not the right word. And then the fruit fly food at the bottom, and yeah, I just, I pour that um, out of a cup and to vitamins, both frogs, uh, red eye tree frogs and the dart frogs need vitamins. So their crickets, or in this case, the fruit flies are dusted every single time they're, they're fed. If you don't do that, they will die. You will kill your frog. Like they have to have the proper vitamins. Um, it's a vitamin A and then the other one is calcium with vitamin D. So those are absolute musts. And if you are weirded out by, by Fly, like I have fruit flies in containers on my counter right now. If that weirds you out, that's probably not the, the critter for you. You do get desensitized to it though. You can get used to it. But those ones are easier because I can breed my own. If I'm not being lazy, I can breed my own. I don't have to regularly order them. If you buy your own, they end up costing about anywhere between seven and $9 for a, that container. And one, I would go through like one a week for the frogs. So I usually buy four at a time. Um, but yeah, that gives you an idea there. But like I said, they, they, those guys haven't had an issue. I've never had issues with parasites on them. Um, but yeah, those are, those are my frogs. Those are the pros and cons of, uh, let's see, there we go, of having them. They're, the crickets are the biggest pain in the butt, having to feed crickets and then knowing I'm feeding them something that absolutely is going to give them parasites, but it's the only thing they're going to eat so we're going to have to deworm the frog. Now, there are easier tree frogs. They will all get parasites, the, the bigger frogs. Anything that's eating the cricket, they're definitely going to get parasites, but they're not as sensitive. They're easier. So the um, white tree frogs are probably one of the easier, and they're so cute. They're also called dumpy frogs at Australian whites. Um, that was my first tree frog back in the 90s. I'd have for like 10, 12, 13 years. Probably would have lived longer had I known about the parasite thing, because that's likely what ended up he should have lived like 20 years, but yeah, there we go. That is my frog information. Okay, back to, um, we'll go back over to, if you have questions about that, let me know, but let's go back to some art questions. Um, this isn't pulling these up. Oh, some of them are, okay. Fly Me to the Moon said, how do you get the fruit flies into the tank? So I just take the container, I open the side of the lid, I'm not gonna do it now because they always escape, and I just tap it into another one of those cups that has vitamins in it, and then I tap that into the tank with the vitamins after they've all been dusted. And they will escape, they will get out. That's probably how I get so many house spiders around here because they have too many fruit flies they end up eating. And those are our flightless fruit flies. They're not gonna fly around. These ones are wingless. Um, there are the bigger, the mellow, whatever, they're bigger ones, but they have wings, they don't fly. Oh, there's, they're a freaking pain. They escape from the tanks, I hate those. So these ones are the, the, the wingless ones are my preference. 
Uh, Oriel Beagle said, it sounds like keeping frogs is just as complicated as que keeping aquarium fish. Yes, because at any point, I may have an outbreak of a bacterial infection that just, I don't know why, or the parasites is an issue. The thing with the aquarium fish, I can quarantine the fish and avoid most parasites. I can't avoid the parasites with these guys because they are going to get parasites. Like, if they eat, they're going to get parasites. So, you know, you have that side of it. But then at the same time, I've often thought about like, what would I do with the big, my, I've got a, a 83 gallon, took me a minute to remember the side, 83 gallon reef tank. What would I do if I decided I didn't want that tank anymore? What would I do with that space? I would probably turn it into a big, huge vivarium with frogs. Even though they're a pain, I would probably still just do some elaborate thing because they are a lot easier. The, the reef tank certainly is more work, especially if I test the water like I'm supposed to, which I never do, um, besides salinity. So yeah, that is, that is my, um, I would say easier in some ways, more of a pain in others. Um, way cheaper, that's for sure. Uh, let's see. Um, does Matt claim any of the frogs? He loves Cookie. Captain Cookie, the albino. Oh, he just, if something happens to that frog, I need to get him replaced before Matt realizes he's gone. Because, oh my God, he is, Matt loves that frog. I'll hear him in there. So my, Matt's a big guy. He's a big, like just, he's tall. He's what? He's a big guy. In there squealing at this little tiny frog at night. He'll sit there with the flashlight to look for him. And oh, you hear him like this big guy. Oh, <laughs> it's so funny. No, Matt, Cookie is definitely Matt's favorite. Um, oh, the other thing to keep in mind, being that they're nocturnal, yeah, those males bark and it sounds, think of a chihuahua that has been smoking two packs a day for 40 years, barking. That is what they sound like. And they get kind of loud at night. They don't keep me up they, and they're not that close to the bedroom. So they're, they keep mad up sometimes, but yeah, I think it's kind of hilarious. Um, it might bug him more if he wasn't so like, he so loves Cookie. Uh, can I demonstrate how to layer colored pencil with OMS? Yeah, I guess I could. I've got time. I mean, yeah, sure. Let me grab a, a sketchbook. Okay. Let's see. Which book is this? Yeah, you'll work. Let me grab a few pencils. Yeah, you guys will work. So the trick with, oh, I need the OMS, huh? The trick with colored pencil and OMS is that you need to do a lot of layers. If you don't have enough layers, it's not gonna work. I just stuck my finger in paint. Um, oh, there's the cup I was looking for earlier. Okay, oof. Yeah, I have tons of videos on colored pencil and OMS, but we may as well do a quick demonstration right now. Oh, this is some, mm, keep that scratch paper. Okay. So, colored pencil and OMS. Light hand. You do not want to push hard with this, um, but it is going to look grainy and gritty if we can kind of see how, I mean, it, it's bumpy. That, and this is a really rough paper, so there's that too, but I'm going to do one layer, and then I'm going to do another layer, and then I'm going to do another layer going another direction, and that pencil, even though it's sharp enough for color, not really sharp enough because it is not getting into all those little nooks and crannies, so I am going to take my sharpener and sharpen it again. And then we're gonna put another layer and see how it's starting to fill in more of those little grainy look areas. And now I'm gonna put another layer. You, these layers can be with different colors, but they need to be there. And now another layer going another direction. And let's put another layer. I'm doing little ovals. Not this. 
you get two harsh start and stop points. They need to be ovals like this so I don't have a, a harsh start and stop point like I would going straight back and forth. That's very important. We don't want it to look scribbled. And then another layer. Now I'm still keeping a light hand. If I start pushing hard, this is not going, that's burnishing, that's a different technique. Now once I get tons of layers on there, I can take my OMS, I can take a little brush. My OMS is drying up. And I can blend that out. And what I'm doing, it's, it's just kind of dissolving the OMS into place or the, the pigment into place. Now you can smudge, like see how this smudges out a little bit, but not a lot. It's not to the extent that you would get with like watercolor or ink tents. Um, it will spread a bit. Now the next step would be to let, which I'm not going to bother with, but you get the idea here, would be to let that dry. Once it dries all the way, I'm gonna do it again. More layers and more layers and more layers and then blend with OMS. And if that's not quite right, I'm gonna do it again. More layers. Now, depending on the pencils, you may have to do more layers. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna keep my pencils sharper because of the way that they blend with my polychromos and do more layers with polychromos. With Derwent Light Fast, I can do less layers because the pigment, the way it blends with OMS, it just dissolves and like fills in all those gaps really, really easily. And then my luminance that I just used is not as blendable. It's like in the middle of the two. So I don't need as many layers as I would with polychromos, but also more than what I would need with Derwent Light Fast. So, and you're just gonna repeat that until you get the results that you're looking for. But you need a lot of pigment. What a lot of people do is they do one light layer and they expect it to do it like a watercolor pencil would where it just spreads everywhere with that light layer. No, you saw how many times I had to go over it and then go over it again. Now let's go over it again and one more time. But don't push hard because that is now burnishing and does not work the same. What does melts do tell? Melts, is, isn't that the Holbein stuff? It's like their version of what OMS does. It's meant to go with the Holbein um, pencils. But you know, those are not all light fast and I don't trust their light fast ratings after having dealt with them. Just a quick reminder if you're like, why are you bashing on Holbein? Holbein, I contacted them because their pencils use, oh, didn't they have like a star rating or something? I don't know where mine are. There was, they were marked with a star, but it didn't, I didn't know what that related to. I contacted them, what does this relate to? And I have a full video going over like the actual emails if you want to know that, just look that, Google that, or you um, look it up on YouTube. But um, for Holbein, I contacted them and I was like, hey, what does this relate to? Do you use blue wool or do you use ASTM? So that was my first question. And it, then which one, like how do you use your star system rate? Because sometimes like with uh, polychromos, they have a couple of pencils that I think are only one star and that's like a four, a three, four on the blue wool, I believe. Or is theirs ASTM? I think theirs was blue. I could have that wrong. But either way, it was like those two pencils I pulled from my list because they're, they're not archival enough for me. So that's all I needed to know. It's not like I'm bashing you because not all your colors are light fast. I just need to know what they are. They w said that it was a proprietary way that they test it. They don't use blue wool or ASTM. Oh, no, no, those are your, that's your industry standard. They're, that is not an answer. So they, um, and I wasn't mean to them. I was like super nice. I'm like, oh, we're trying to get, drag more information. Well, how does it, you know, I'm trying to get more. They stopped responding to me. They did not know I was a YouTuber. Um, I bet they really wish they did. Because, and one of my friends has done promo videos for them. Um, and they gave her very different answers than they gave me. And right there, that makes me not trust them. So if you knew I was a YouTuber, you'd be helpful to the customer. You would give information to the customer, but because I'm just a customer in your eyes, I'm not worth answering the questions of. So right now you're a-holes. Like I will not, I'm not buying from you. For If that's how you treat your customers, like if I found out that's how Derwent treated their customers, I would not be promoting them to you guys. Like that is just no. So um, yeah, that was, I mean, you may have one off bad situations, but they could have contacted me in the meantime and corrected this whole problem. They never did. They never reached out, never once obviously they had my email. So yeah, they are shady as heck and I don't trust them. And then they came out with new ratings and said that they were using blue wool or ASTM. Wait, then why didn't you tell me that? Why all of a sudden now you did? That takes time. You didn't just do that overnight. So was your guy that you were had talking to me just full of crap and making crap up? Possible, absolutely possible. Or more likely, because it's a Japanese company, they do things very differently than us and that's fine but don't lie about it. Oh, they're all very light fast. Well, it turns out they're not. And then the, the information when they finally, we finally dragged this information out. 
we look up what they claimed those were and it was extremely different than what private testing had shown on their products um by a, like some of the colors were really like mm. so yeah i don't trust that company i don't buy anything from them anymore and i used to like their airbrush paint okay i don't trust them and i have talked to Fun side story. I was talking to somebody else who works in the, air, the industry who makes airbrush paint and they were telling me because I was like why or people had asked they're like why it wasn't even me I take it back this one was me reading somebody else's experience I get all my stories mixed up so um, anyway somebody else had talked to them but they were like why are your com colors you've got colors that are listed as toxic and other brands don't list theirs as toxic and they're like because we take it more seriously basically their ratings are more critical and more accurate, and this is, uh, was another company, versus Holbein, and I'm like, wow, that so fits with what my experience with Holbein, just, I don't think they care. They just, I don't trust the company, I'm not trusting my art with them, they are a nope for me. But Melts is their, uh, I believe they were there, that was their blender, I could be wrong. I get things mixed up. Um, let's see, Dolphin Soul said, no, you can't use OMS on pencils that are on top of Pam Pastels, right, you can. Um, but I spray my Pam Pastels first, I oh, it's over there, with Spectrafix before I put colored pencil and then I can blend if I needed to. I usually don't. But if you need to go over that with OMS, you absolutely can. But if your Pam Pastels are on there super thick and you've not sprayed them and you go over that with OMS, you know, colored pencils and then OMS, it turns into this weird pasty, it's not cute. I mean, you didn't ruin anything. You just have to rework that area completely. So you kind of ruined it, but not permanently. Um, so yeah, you've got to balance like having enough spray and then enough colored pencil. Then you go with colored pencil on top of it. So by spray, I mean Spectrafix, then you're, you, you're fixative and then you can do OMS if you need to. But if that, that pen pastel is super thick, that will get a pasty weird look. Um, Hitomi said, you are not the only YouTuber I heard about Holbein as a company. Yeah, and it's, yeah, I just am not, a, and I've got a more, like, I go through the actual emails with them because I know I'm, I'm paraphrasing stuff and not getting it accurate. So everything's much more accurate in the video, like the full review. The only thing that's different is afterwards, and I've had people contact me, oh, they came out with new light fast ratings. Will you update the video? No, because I think they're BS. I don't believe those light fast ratings. Why would I believe that at this point? With what they said to me and suddenly they have new light fast ratings. So did you make it up? Are they real? I don't know. I genuinely don't know and I don't trust you. I don't trust with how they talk to me. I don't trust that they just ghosted me after they me asking questions. And I was super nice in those emails. This wasn't like me right now, I'm ranting. Yeah, if I talked like this to them on the phone, I would have hung up on my butt. But that's not what the case was. It was like super nice, super friendly, like just asking basic questions. And I was apparently not important enough for them, which means you're not important enough to them, which means they don't give a crap if they're producing quality materials. They only care that you buy it. They don't care that that we have faith in that their stuff is going to last that they're going to be good they obviously don't care so i won't touch them um let's see and, and the funny thing is all these youtubers were making videos before how they're the best colored pencil oh my gosh they're so good they're okay they're weird i and i talked about that in the review they're not i'm not saying they're the worst pencil in the world they are overpriced though for the quality by they're so they're one of the most expensive colored pencils and they're not as light fast as they claim. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not throwing my money at that, but it was like, for some reason, because some of these YouTubers actually order them because you had to get them from Japan in the past, now you can get them here in the US because they hadn't done the toxicity tests. So there was that. Some people said they've changed. Before it was like mostly pastel colors, which I don't know why you need that many pastel pinks, but okay. Um, but yeah, they a lot of people were making videos how they're the best in the world. And I'm like, okay, first off, I've seen your art. I don't think you are experienced enough with colored pencil to be making that claim. But second of all, I know that it's not true. So I mean, I used them. So yeah, there are a lot of some questionable. Some there are a lot of videos I saw that I was like, okay, um, let's see. Python said, do you prefer Caran d'Ache Luminance or Derwent Lightfast for general use? I like Luminance because of the harder core, but I'd love to hear your opinion. It comes down to the color in many cases. Most of the time, like just the, let's say I had the exact same two pencils and it just, which one am I gonna grab? And they're the exact same color and color. So color, again, no factor, light fast, hands down. They blend so amazing with OMS. So for my techniques, I like those better. However, they're 
similar, like the average person who has not done as many, like when you get it to where you've done hundreds and hundreds of pieces, you get more picky about things than you might otherwise. Like example, when I first started drinking wine, I could not tell the difference between what somebody considered good wine and what somebody considered bad wine. To me, it all tasted like feet. So uh, it didn't matter. Me making a comparison video on wine would have made no sense. I wasn't experienced enough to tell the difference. Now when it's like, oh, I can taste the cherry and the oak and the, like, I can tell. So back then I could not. And now I, I don't, I, even now I don't drink it often enough that I'm an expert on that, but at least I have a better idea because, you know, I've had more to drink over the years. But back then I could not make a legitimate review. And I think that that, like, or I couldn't tell the difference. So, I mean, you do the, I like what I like, but you can't, I couldn't tell the difference enough. Now I certainly can, um, with the colored pencils, I can really tell the difference between the two because I've been using them for so long. So what my experience with them may not be the same as somebody who has completed like 20 pieces, hundreds of pieces. My experience is just more like my, I will notice more differences than somebody who hasn't completed as much. Does that mean their work is bad? No, not at all. It's nothing to do with that. It's just when you get more experience, you get more picky, I guess. You notice little things differently, but both are an amazing pencil. So I can't, they're both great. Um, the Caran d'Ache Luminance has a bigger variety of certain colors, like my reds, my, uh, a lot of the different greens. I mean, they just have a bigger variety overall of, of those colors. Light fast, Derwent Light Fast, best purples of any pencil ever. They are, oh God, I love all their purples. They're purples, they're plums, like all of those. But their reds and oranges are very lacking, which is weird. But I like, I don't know why they're lacking. They're very limited on what you've got there. So if I'm looking for a set that is most, let's say I need, I could only buy one set and I wanted as many colors as possible, I'm gonna go with Caran d'Ache Luminance and I'm gonna add in a few of the purples from, I'll just buy some individuals of Lightfast. But if color's not an issue, Lightfast, hands down, I love how they work. Um, let's see, and a lot of that is just my technique. If somebody works differently, they may like the other better. They may like polychromos, but like it, it completely depends on your technique will make a big difference. They are all quality pencils. So I can't be like, this one's definitely better than the other. My top three, polychromos, Derwent Lightfast, and Caradosh Luminance. Any of those three, you're gonna be happy with, but your, your technique may adjust a little bit depending on which one you go with. Um, let's see. Holbein Luminous Acrylics, love them. What are Luminous Acrylics? Are they their, let me guess, they're glow in the dark or fluorescent. I would not be surprised if that was the answer because those are not light fast colors ever, which seems quite fitting for Holbein. I mean, I don't actually know. Hold on, let's, let's Google this. Let's find out. I'm just making an assumption based on the name. So it may just be bad marketing on their part. Holbein Luminous Acrylic Paint. Yeah, those aren't gonna be light fast. Those are, um, it doesn't matter who you buy them from, those aren't light fast colors. Anytime you get into fluorescent colors, they're never light fast. Like it's just the nature of that. So, I mean, it doesn't matter the brand. Uh, let's see, heavy body luminance. Yeah, those are all, do they even tell you? I'm curious what they claim the light fast ratings are, which I would call BS on if they say that they're light fast because they're not. Um, No, stop it with your ads. No, go away. Reviews. I'm not seeing anything. I'm trying to see if I can get any light fast. Wait, I, I'm curious what they claim the light fast is. I'm just on Blick's website right now. Um, it doesn't say, I'm not seeing anything. Yeah, I'm not gonna keep looking. Um, yeah, no, no, those aren't light fast. So it doesn't matter what brand you go with. They're not, I mean, just be aware of that. I didn't even see, I'm curious. How much are they charging for that crap? Oh crap, speaking of crap, I can't use the right buttons. Okay, here we go. $68 for a set of six, 60 ml tubes. What are these? Wow, okay, so this is 108 or 118 milliliters. This is completely light fast, all the Liquitex basics I get, and I probably paid like five, six dollars for this, right around there. They have a set of six, 60 ml, so less than half of this 
and they want $80. So they are like, what are they charging for that in that case? Um, 10, 12, 12 ish dollars. I don't math. So they're basically working out to be about $12 ish per somebody do the math for me. What's 70 bucks or $68 divided by six. Um, that's how much they're charging for two. So they are charging up the rear for non-light fast colors. Good job, Holbein. Why am I not surprised? I mean, part of why it's expensive is they're importing them from, from Japan. So all that's generally going to be more expensive, but mm, yep, that's a big flippin' nope for me. Um, have you used Derwent drawing pencils? Yes, I love them. Yep. I absolutely love them and I too want them to expand the line. I recommend you email them and ask them too because maybe if enough of us bug Derwent, just like, can you please be nice about it? Please, please, please give us more colors of these. We want light fast, but we want these pencils. Oh my gosh, because I love them for backgrounds with colored pencils. They blend better than anything else. They fill in faster because they're bigger and then they just blend so well with OMS. I love the results I get with them. Uh, are polychromous oil or wax? I can't blend them with OMS. You can't, yes, or not I can't, I can't. Uh, they are considered an oil base, so they have all colored pencils are a mixture of oil, clay, wax, like they're all everything. But in practice, like how much oil versus how much wax, we call them just like as a way that we understand how they work. Higher, they're the highest oil-based pencil that I use by a long shot. So oil-based, um, and yes, they do blend with OMS, but I'm typically gonna do more layers with them and keep my, my lead sharper to make sure it's getting into all the little nooks and crannies of the paper than I do with some of the wax-based pencils. The softer pencils blend smoother, easier. They don't require as many layers. It's just the nature of the pencil. Now that doesn't mean those are, that means they're better. It's just different techniques for what you're working on. Exactly. Python said golden heavy body uh, tubes were $60 Canadian for six tubes, so less in USD for light fast quality long lasting tubes. Exactly. Like Goldens, I trust. Goldens and Liquitex would be my go to. I, I needed to do the Goldens mat. I'll have to order some of them soon to see how I feel about those. It's just like, I love my Liquitex Basics. They, part of the, my love of Liquitex Basics is that they do dry, they're, they're a more satin finish, but not just that, they dry slower than all the other acrylics I've used. And I don't know why that is. Like they're just the perf, the timing. I'm just so used to them. I've got the timing down with those. So, but I need to give Goldens a chance. Do I mix brands to make one light fast set? Mm, well, I use all three. All three are in their own uh, pencil box base like and organized by color so it's organized by brand per box and then within each box by color but i use all three like when i'm working with colored pencil i bring all three brands out so yes i guess and i pulled the ones that are not good night rob um let's see Python said, I like polychromos the best because of seamless layering and blending, then Caran d'Ache Luminance, and then Derwent Lightfast because the ingrav, I don't know how to say that because I can't read right now, towards harder core, polychromos blend the best for me. See, I'm the, I'm the reverse. I find because of the way, and it's all, tech. see, exam that's a perfect example. It's all technique. The way that my technique is, Lightfast blend the best for me. So I can get any of them to blend just fine, so it doesn't, it's not a really big thing. Prismacolor does have some light fast colors as well. They do, but they are your mm, value. So we talk about value of a pencil. Prismacolor is gonna break because the wind blew across the seas in a direction they weren't comfortable with. Um, like Prismacolors are just little pansies who, I have other words, but I'm trying to keep it family friendly. Um, they're little, I can't use the words I want to use, but they are any of them, man, I've got so many words to fill that. None of them are appropriate, but they, they, you may, you may look at them and go, okay, it was only, let's say a dollar 50 for a pencil. I actually don't know what they're going for these days. Yeah. But like, you're going to use a quarter of that pencil. The rest of it is continuously resharpening it because it keeps breaking. And I know it. I've done all the tricks. Trust me. I know all the tricks, put them in the oven, put them in the microwave. I don't recommend that for anything that has metal writing on it. You know, you can do things to kind of melt them back in place. Here's the thing. I don't have time to jump through hoops to get a pencil to do its job. I just need it to do what I paid for it. 
like I just need it to be a pencil. I need it to work like a pencil. I shouldn't have to keep fixing their pro. That's not a normal thing. Like every other brand of pencil, I never have to jump through hoops. They just work. They're not constantly breaking. They're not like, I don't see any value. And I have all the, you know, I've got Prismacolor. I don't, that's what I started with years ago. I don't see any reason to fight with their problems. Like it, there's no value in it because yeah, okay. They may be cheaper than a lot of the other brands, but you're not getting as much use per pencil because they're constantly freaking breaking. You're constantly wasting time trying to fix things. So yeah, Prismacolors are a never for me. Dolphin Soul said, ever going to use those watercolor paper stretcher boards to review? Ugh, I need to. They're still sitting in my cabinet back there. Like, I just haven't. The reason is, and I always forget, I need to go to, like, Walmart or something and get a big tote that I can put distilled water in because I want to keep everything with distilled water and soak them in that first, like, to, I, yeah. But wait, I, yeah. I need a paper to get them wet in that way. Unless, yeah, so I just always forget. Um... Elaine said, Prismacolor is great as long as you don't sneeze while holding one, drop one, hold them too tight, breathe too hard, et cetera, et cetera. Have a dinner they didn't like. Um, I, I could list anything, like the wrong person walked into the room and it offended the pencil. Like it could be anything. It could be anything. It doesn't like the story it heard on the news. I don't know. They are just, mm. but that's not to say, now if you have Prismacolors, that is not to say that you can't produce beautiful, stunning, amazing work with them. You absolutely can you're just going to fight with them during the process. And I don't think the I don't think the value is there. I just, if I'm going to pay for something, I want it to work. I feel, I mean, it's like, I'm not going to pay for a product where I'm the beta tester. Although Prismacolor is super old, so you're not beta testing anymore, but it kind of feels like that. Like, is this one going to work today? Is it not? I don't know. Um, but if you have Prismacolors, don't feel like you shouldn't use them or can't use them. You can produce beautiful work with them. You're just going to jump through a few hoops along the way. Fly to the I can't talk. I'm tired. You can tell us the end of the stream. Fly me to the moon. Said so. What you have to bake them before you use them? How often do you need to bake? No. Well, no. Like if you had one that you dropped or you had one that kept breaking, like the the core inside the pencil will break. So you'll sharpen it, and that the tip will just keep pulling out because it's broken multiple times often throughout the um, thing. What happens is let's back that up a little bit. The, the way that they make them, they're using warped pencils. Like some of those you get and it's like the shape of a boat. I mean, it's pretty extreme on some cases. So no matter what, when you sharpen it, it continuously snaps the pencil. So if you've got a, a warped uh, wood casing, you're screwed. Some of the wood casing, the wood that they're using just splinters like crazy. It doesn't matter how, how sharp, how good of a sharpener you have, it will just splinter and that starts causing breaking. And they're a wax-based pencil. They're more brittle than some of the other pencils anyway. And that's, I'm not criticizing them for being wax-based or brittle. That is fine. But your case better handle it. Like, um, the other thing is that they aren't all centered. So when you sharpen them, the whole thing, like the pencil's kind of going sideways continuously through the sharpener. That's my, what I think it looks like. Um, that snaps the lead. So now you've got lead snapped all the way through. You can put it in the oven and hopefully not too high. I don't remember, I'd have to look up. I don't remember what people were putting them in at. I don't remember what I tried it at. It works, it melts it back into place so you can use it again. But because the wood casing is bad, it's probably just gonna happen again. So yeah. Um. What do I think about Karen? This is from Robert. What do I think about Karen Dosh Supercolor? I've never used it. Supercolor. I've not used it, so I don't have any opinion there. Um, okay. I think we are all caught up. We'll go ahead and wrap this up. We are at 10 o'clock tonight. Thank you guys so much for joining. I definitely get M. Granwaller. Uh, you guys, some, some, a bunch of you messaged me the, the screenshot. So the, I've got to order some other acrylics. Apparently we're going to have to have a review. I'll do a full review, like comparing the two. Uh, I'll compare that to Liquitex Basics of those um, very soon. And what else? Um, thank you guys for joining. I don't know what we're doing next week. I don't know, something something wintry or Christmassy or something something seasonal. Um, and thank you guys so much. I will see you guys over in our Patreon Discord. I need to post the updated link for those who maybe didn't get, it's supposed to automatically put you in when you join, but sometimes it doesn't, so I have to send you guys a link. Um, and the reason that I don't, the reason that I've only been doing the seven day links is because I don't want that permanent link posted 
because sometimes people are kind of jerks and they'll post that other places for people, even though they left the group and then they post it. So other people, I don't want spammers ending up in the group basically. So I'm um, like, I just let it be a new one every seven days. Once you're in, you're in. But anyway, thank you guys so much. And I will see you guys next. Oh, check, uh, make sure to check out our moderators channels. The link is in the video description for them. We've got Joseph has live streams every week. And what else? I don't remember what else I'm supposed to. I always forget important things. Um, sign up for Patreon, $6 a month. You get access to our Discord channel and 400 lessons, like long lessons. Anyway, I'll see you guys later. I don't even know where my buttons are. I lost the buttons. That's not even the right button. Or maybe it was this button. How about this one? Nope, that didn't work. Nope, didn't work again. That's the one. <laughs>